But we've made it all the way from Genesis all the way through the Old Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And now we're in the book of Romans this week, so we're going to talk about Romans this morning. And uh, Romans is uh, is safe to say it's one of the most important books of the Bible. All the books are important, but some of them uh, have more significance. And what Romans is famous for, you may have heard of this before, you may not have heard of this. The Romans Road to Salvation. And what that was, probably back in the 70s and 80s, this is real popular. If you wanted to tell somebody how to be saved, you would go to the book of Romans, show them three, four, or five verses out of Romans, and explain to them how uh, they were a sinner, how Jesus died for them, how salvation was a gift, and how if you called upon that Lord, He would save you. And there's a chance if you walked down an aisle one time and you prayed with a preacher or somebody showed you some Bible verses at Vacation Bible School, you may not remember what they told you. There's a good chance they used verses out of Romans because that's what people have done for, uh, for decades and for centuries really is tried to use Romans to show a person how to be saved. And the reason they did that is because Romans is one of the clearest books in the Bible that teaches you how you can be saved, how you can gain eternal life. And so what we're doing this morning is go through the Romans road. Uh, we're going to do a little longer walk on it probably than what uh, uh, five minutes. We're not going to spend five minutes on this, but we're going to go to the book of Romans and just see what it says about how a person is saved. And really, this is very basic, um, but sometimes we need to go back to the basics. These are the basic things the Bible teaches about how a person gains eternal life. You need to know this like you know the back of your hand. You need to know this like you know your own birthday. You need to know what the Bible teaches about how you can go to heaven when you die, how you have eternal life. So we're going to start off reading in Romans 3, verse number 10. These are verses, I mean, if you if you mark verses in your Bible, if you highlight verses, um, these are verses you need to know. I mean, these are just some basic verses that everybody needs to know. So we're going to start off by reading Romans chapter 3, verse number 10. This is what the Bible says. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. The verse just says this, there is no one who is righteous. Now this is kind of interesting. James and I went visiting on Monday night. We visited a fellow down here off 106. We were just knocking on doors to people we did not know. And I used this verse with him because we were talking to this gentleman. He knows a lot of y'all. Y'all probably know him. I don't even remember what his name was. Don't, don't even, they didn't need to ask me. But uh, when I asked him, I said, do you believe that you are going to, are going to go to heaven when you die? And he kind of said, uh, oh, that's a tough question. There's a lot of different ways to answer that question, and he kind of, and he ended up, this is what he said. I have, uh, he said, I have never done anything really bad. Okay? Well, I said, well, the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Okay? And I told him, this is what I told him. I said, the reality is I've sinned, James has sinned, you sinned, the guy that just drove by us on the road is a sinner. We're all sinners. And, and then he says something like this. Well, yeah, it's hard not to sin every day. So he kind of understood. He kind of did right? So in one breath he said, I'm not that bad. And he's like, yeah, but I'm not that good either. Yeah, I'll admit that. So most people kind of like, yeah, I'm not that bad. I'm not that good. Well, here's the reality. You need to understand this. In God's eyes, by God's standard, you are not righteous. What does that mean? It means that God does not look at you and say that you're innocent. He does not look at you and say that you are uh, uh, that you have lived a good, righteous life. The reality is, we're all sinners. We've all broken God's law. You've got to understand, in God's eyes, I'm not righteous. He does not look at me and say, he is a good person. He looks at us and says, we are guilty. The next verse to understand, Romans 3.23, you've got to understand this. This is a classic verse right here. Romans 3.23. Um, you, I mean, this is one you need to know. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, that's the same idea right there. We have all sinned, right? We've all, what is a sin? What does it mean to sin? Well, you can probably say some things that are sins, but you know what it means to sin? It's very simple. It means you break God's law. Okay? See, there's laws. Uh, schools have rules. Georgia has laws. United States has laws. Your parents have rules. Get them else has some laws. God does. And the, the laws are in this book. The laws are written on your heart. The Bible actually teaches us. But what the reality is, we don't all obey God's laws all the time. We've all sinned and fallen short 
of the glory of God. That means that we are not as good as Jesus was. We do not measure up to God's standard. You might be better than me. You might be better than the person sitting beside you. You might be better than your wife, better than your husband. You might have been a better kid growing up than some other kids were. But you sin and you fall short. I heard a preacher use this illustration one time. I liked it. If we were standing on the coast of California, all of us on the coast of California, we were going to try to swim to Hawaii. Some of us would make it farther than others, right? I don't know who would go the farthest. Uh, probably wouldn't be me. I tried to get, I did get started to be a lifeguard one time, and I'm about around doing it. Uh, that's a lot harder than you think. I had to swim 500 yards without touching the bottom floor of the pool, and it was very difficult. So, you know what the reality is, though? If we went from California to Hawaii, somebody here might go farther than somebody else, but you know what? We'd all fall short, right? We'd all fall short. And that's what the Bible teaches. See, you might be a little bit better than somebody else. You might not do everything wrong that somebody else does wrong. You might not have never done that or never done that. But the reality is, you've sinned and fallen short. You're not righteous in God's eyes. Uh, go out on a limb here. Uh, this is kind of a gamble to ask this. Anybody in here, was anybody here at the valedictorian in your class? Well, roll the dice and think the answer is no. Right. So somebody in here might have been a little smarter, somebody in here might have been a little closer to the top, somebody might have been real close to the bottom, somebody might have been on the bottom. But you all fell short, right? See, it doesn't matter. What we want to do is talk about how we we're, think we're better than this person. I've never done that. So you know what the reality is? You're not righteous. You've sinned and fallen short. If you stand before God on your own, it's not, you're not going to be innocent. You're not going to hear, you did so good, you get to come into heaven. You're a sinner who is guilty. That is the very basic, fundamental truth that everybody in this room needs to understand. And everybody in the world needs to understand, right? The guy, that's what I was trying to explain to him. That's the first thing. You are a sinner. You have broken God's law. You're in trouble because you've broken God's law. That's the reality. I hope you understand that. But look, that's not the whole message, is that the Bible has good news. And then this is some of the best stuff in the Bible right here. I'm going to read Romans 3.23. Then I'm going to read verse 24. Because when you put this together, it helps you. Listen to this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All right? Verse, it's, it's, it's shame to know verse 23 and not know verse 24. Because verse 23 says you've sinned and fallen short. But verse 24 says this. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? What does it mean to be justified? Well, that means that you are made righteous. Okay? It means that you are made righteous in God's eyes. It's a legal term. To be justified is for somebody to look at you, the judge look at you, and say, that person is righteous. How do you become righteous? You're not righteous on your own. How do you become just in God's eyes? How does God look at you and say, yes, he's good enough. Well done. Enter the kingdom of preparing you for the foundation of the world. You have eternal life. How do you get to that point? Well, Bible says, listen, this is so good. You are justified freely. Free. That's a good word, isn't it? Everybody know what free means? I think you do. That means there's something that you don't work for. It's given to you, right? This is free. That's the way salvation is. You are justified freely, okay, by His grace, okay? What is grace? Grace means that you don't get what you deserve. You get a blessing instead. It means it's God's unmerited favor. It's undeserved favor. That's how a person is saved. By grace. And what is, what is grace? What, what does it mean that this little book is in our Welcome Center back there? It's entitled Grace by Max Licato. He tells a little story in here that I really like. That to me, see, grace is when, I'm trying to explain this to my kids, and it's kind of a, it's a crazy concept that you do something bad and the person doesn't punish you, they give you something good when you do something bad. That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Uh, kids can't even hardly understand that. You mean, I do something bad and don't get punished? No, you don't get punished. You get favor instead. Listen to this little story. All right. Um, um, Victor Hugo introduced us to Jean Valjean in the classic Les Miserables. Valjean enters the pages as a vagabond, a just-released prisoner in midlife, wearing threadbare trousers and a tattered jacket. 
19 years in a French prison have left him rough and fearless. He's walked for four days in the alpine chill of 19th century southeastern France, only to find that no inn will take him, no tavern will feed him. Finally, he knocks on the door of a pastor's house. Pastor Muriel is a 75-year-old. Like Valjean, he has lost much. The revolution took all the valuables from his family except some silverware, a soup ladle, and two candlesticks. Valjean tells his story and expects the pastor to turn him away, but the pastor is kind. He asks the visitor to sit near a fire. You need not to tell me who you are, he explains. This is not my house, it's the house of Jesus Christ. After some time, the pastor takes the ex-convict to the table where they dine on soup and bread, figs and cheese with wine, using the bishop's fine silverware. He shows Valjean to a bedroom. In spite of the comfort, the ex-prisoner can't sleep. In spite of the kindness of the bishop, he can't resist the temptation. He stuffs the silverware into his knapsack. The, preacher, the pastor sleeps through the robbery, and Valjean runs into the night. But he doesn't get far. The policemen catch him and march him back to the pastor's house. Valjean knows what his capture means. Prison for the rest of his life. But then something wonderful happens. Before the officer can explain the crime, the bishop, the pastor steps forward. Oh, here you are. I'm so glad to see you. I can't believe you forgot the candlesticks. They're made of pure silver as well. Please take them with the forks and spoons I gave you. All right, I don't know if you understood that story. This guy comes to his house. He's a prisoner. He steals all his stuff, right? And the guy, the guy gets arrested, and he's got his valuables, and he comes back, and what does the man say? Oh, there you are. Look, you forgot to take all this other stuff along with what I gave you. What would be the man's reaction to that? <laughs> wow. I'll tell you all this. Look, and we will sign this guy. Grace is shocking. Grace has a shock value to it. The prodigal son has wasted all his father's money. What does the father do when the son comes home? Let's get the best robe and put it on him. New sandals on his feet. Ring on his finger. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. Throw his arms around his neck and kiss him. You know what that is? It's grace. It's heaven. You don't deserve this. You've been bad. But you know what? You've been bad. But I'm going to be good to you. That's how we're saved. You understand that? By God's grace. We sing the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was a wretch. I deserve to be punished. I'm not righteous. I've sinned. I've fallen short. But God looks at me. How are we saying? Look, this is what the verse says. We're justified freely by His grace that came through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What does redemption mean? It means to pay somebody's debt. To pay a ransom. The Bible says Jesus Christ gave His life a ransom for many. What does that mean? The reason God can forgive me, the reason God can give me eternal life is because Jesus died for my sins on the cross. That's the good news of the Bible. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven, but Jesus died for me. He gave his life. There's an old saying, Jesus paid a debt he did not owe because I owed a debt I could not pay. Right? That's grace. Hey, and guess what? That's how I'm saved. I've fallen short, but I've been justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's how you gain eternal life. That's how you become right with God. Not by saying, I've never done anything that bad. Right? That's the wrong answer. I wish there was a bunch of different answers that work. That answer don't work. That ain't going to fly. You have sinned. You have fallen short. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Now watch this. Watch this. This actually gets better right here. Romans 3.28. This is just a, a classic verse right here that uh, you need to know. I think, I think you need to know this verse. This is what Paul said right here. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. See, this is what he's saying. Paul said, we conclude that a man is justified. That means to be made righteous by faith apart from the deeds of the law. It's very important. What does that mean? It means that when I put my faith in Jesus I put my faith in the Son of God who died for me and rose again. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I am made righteous apart from the deeds of the law. What does that mean? It means that it's not based on me 
keeping the Ten Commandments is not based on my behavior. It's not based on me being a good person. It's not based on me being better than I was before. It's based on grace. It's based on faith. It's just as simple as John 3.16. Everybody knows the verse, but not everybody really understands the verse. That God loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Period. Right? This is how a person is saved. By putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. By knowing this. I'm a sinner. I'm falling short. I'm not good enough on my own. But I see who Jesus is and what He's done for me. And I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And a man is made righteous. And you know what this is? It's good news. It's good news that apart from the law, apart, I, I'm telling you, this is what the Bible says. This is why the Romans road is significant. It points out how you're made right. I am justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. That means it's 100% based on what Jesus did. It's 0% based on what being Huff is doing, will do, has done. It's not because I've become a better person. It's based on Jesus and his death. That's how I'm justified, by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Um, I, I'll go to Romans 5 and 1. This is a, a great verse. A great verse. And this is what it says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, I have peace with God. That means it's so significant. I got my sound big deal. It means my standing before God, we have peace. Not going to punish me. See, as far as I know, I have peace with my wife. I'm not scared to go home after her. I think I do. Uh, once in a while, you know, you kind of know that things ain't too good, so you don't want to go home, right? You know what I'm talking about, lady, you're short. You can laugh now. Uh, <laughs> and once in a while, you know, we ain't on good terms. I pop over the phone, and I ain't really want to go see her right now. You know, I'll just go out of my office or go mess with dogs a little bit. So, uh, yeah. but when you have peace, you know everything's good right now. As far as I know, I have peace with all y'all. I'm not scared to shake your hand in the back door. We're on good terms as far as I know. We've got peace. Guess what? I've got peace with God. When I stand before God, there's harmony there. I, I'm, not, I'm not fearful of, of, of meeting God. I'm not fearful of standing before God. Why? Because I have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been justified by faith. That's what the verse says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I, I'm not, I'm not going, up, I'm not going to die and say, well, I hope I've been good enough. I hope y'all ain't mad about what I did right there before I died. I hope you ain't mad about what I did in high school or college. I hope you ain't mad about the way I treated my wife or the way I raised my kids. I hope you ain't mad about. I'm not hoping about that. I have peace with God. How do I have peace with God? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been justified by faith. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how you're saved. Romans six twenty three is a classic verse. I mean, you need to know this verse. Um, it just, it, it, it's just explaining this. I, I'm doing this briefly, okay? Um, I wish I had more time, honestly. But Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, the wages for our sin is death. That's the punishment. That's the consequence. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, I'm a sinner. I deserve death. I deserve to be punished. But the gift that God has given me is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, by faith, when I trust in Christ, I have peace with God. My sins are forgiven. And I am righteous in God's eyes. Um, and that, that's how you're saved. So listen to this. If somebody asks me how a person can go to heaven, if somebody asks me why do you think you're going to heaven, do you think you're going to heaven when you die? Um, the answer is going to be yes, because Jesus died for me, and I believe in him. And I know this, I'm saved by grace, it's a gift, and I'm saved by putting my faith in Christ, and I have done that. And you know what? You need to know that like you know the back of your hand. I thought about this. What's two plus two? Everybody in this room knows that. There's like no, uh, oh, wait, come on. what's five plus five? Yeah. Very good. I'm glad you got that right. <laughs> uh, Everybody in this room can count to 100. Like, you know how to count to 100. You learned that, right? 
Everybody here knows your ABCs. If we had to stand up and say your ABCs, it don't matter how nervous you are, you say ABC, D, E, F, G, I think you can get that. You get through it, right? It's something you know. I mean, those things you know, you've learned that. Guess what? You need to know how you're saved. See, I know in whom I have believed, Paul said, and I'm convinced that we keep it on in trust him for that name. I know I'm a sinner. I'm not denying that. No, I know that. I know I'm not righteous. I know I fall short. I'm not going to start talking about how good I am if you ask me if I'm going to heaven. I know I'm not righteous. I'm all, I know I fall short. But I know this. I know that Jesus died for me, and I am justified freely. I know it's free. I know it's by his grace. I know it's not something I earned. Just like the guy with a little book I read. He was rotten, but the guy was good to him. That's the reality of how I'm saved. I've been rotten, but God has been good to me, and Christ redeemed me on the cross, and I'm justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. I know that. And nobody will confuse me on that. I know what 2 plus 2 is. I know what 5 plus 5 is. I can count 100. I can say my ABCs, and I know how I'm going to heaven when I die. And this is what you need to do. You need to do the same thing. You need to know it. You need to be clear on this. Okay? There needs to be no hesitation. You need to know I'm a sinner, but Jesus is my Savior. And it's a free gift, and it's based on what He did for me on the cross. And I hope everybody understands that. I hope everybody's on the same page this morning. But that right there, in a, in a nutshell, is how a person is saved. Now, um, I, the, the, the last little part of this would be come down to this. Well... If, if I'm saved by grace and it's free and it's a gift and it's based on what Jesus did, can you live any other way you want to? Can you just do whatever you want to do? Okay. If that's the reality and it's not based on my behavior, if I'm made righteous by faith apart from the law, then why would I even bother to do good at all? Why, why don't I even go to church? Why don't I even be here? Why don't I just quit? If I, if I get to heaven free, if this is a gift, if this is grace, why don't I just do whatever I want to do? Well, Romans answers these questions also. And we'll start off in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2 right here. Well, this is not going to take long. And uh, it helps explain this. And I try to explain this regularly, so this is not something we've never talked about. But um, Romans 6, 1, let's see what this says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? It says, certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See, he says, shall we just keep on sinning so that grace may abound? In other words, if I'm saved by grace, why don't I just keep sinning here and then grace will cover every bit of it? Well, he says, certainly not. And he asks this question, how shall we who died to sin continue to live in it? See, he's, it's very clear right here. When a person gets saved, when a person believes, something happens to that person. He says, you died to sin. And to me, one of the biggest passages that helps explain this is Romans 2.28. He's already talked about this, but this helps to put all this together about how you can be saved by grace, how it's a free gift. But when you believe, you die to sin. Romans 2.28, listen to what it says. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. That's real wordy and kind of confusing, but I'll explain it. He's talking about who is really a Jew, who is really a child of God. And he says it has nothing to do with outward circumcision. True circumcision is done to the heart by the Spirit of God. All right? What that means is when a person becomes a believer, the Spirit of God comes and does a surgery on their heart. He circumcises their heart. He clips. He changes. He transforms. He renews. He uh, he makes their heart come alive to God. There is something that takes place inside that person. I read another verse, Romans 5, 5. This, is a, this is a verse also helps explain this. And I think it's very important. Romans 5, 5 says, No hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. See, what that verse says is that oh, this is what happens when a person is saved. The Holy Spirit does a work in their life, in their heart. The Bible says the love of God is poured out into their heart. See, that's what happens by the Holy Spirit. So when I, when I believe, when I am saved, it's not just a matter of, well, I get a ticket 
get to heaven and I get right back on the road and I'm the exact same person I used to be. That is not what the Bible teaches happens. God does a work in your heart by His Holy Spirit. The love of God is poured out in your heart and it makes you into a different person. You're not a perfect person. You're not going to never stumble again. You're just... You're, you, Guarantee you will stumble again. It's a guarantee. You read Romans 7. If you want to hear somebody, Paul struggled finally against sin because his flesh was still sinful. But he said, I delight in the law of God according to the inner man. My heart has been changed. And that means, Romans 6, 6, Paul says it like this, trying to explain this. He says, no, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. See, Paul said our old man was crucified our old man was crucified. It means it's the circumcision of the heart. It's the pouring out of the Holy Spirit into our heart. The old man is crucified. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul, this is what it's coming down to. This is, what, this is how this makes perfect sense to me. Salvation is free. It is a gift. It is based on grace. But it changes the person. There is a result of, of being saved. It does not make that person perfect, but it's the old saying, I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. Anybody agree with that? See, I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I ought to be. I, uh, you want to say that, tell them about that, huh? See, she can tell you that. There's somebody who knows, you, knows you're not what you ought to be, okay? Everybody might not know that about you, but somebody knows that about you, or you know that about you. We'll look at that, right? You at least know I'm not what I think I ought to be. I mess up. I still don't. But you know what the reality is? I'm not what I used to be, right? God's done a work in my heart, a work on the inner man that has changed my desires and my passions. And this is the bottom line. When a person receives the gift of salvation, it makes a difference in their life. I thought about all this. If, uh, if somebody in here just really uh, decided they really loved me, and they said, I'm going to give you $100,000. I'm going to give you, Pastor, just slip this in your back pocket at the back door. A hundred thousand dollars. Let me say about this. That would improve our relationship. I say about this. That would drastically improve our relationship. Right? Let's be honest here. People always like, well, I don't know if the pastor likes me or not. I can't tell if the pastor likes me. If you do that, I, I will like you will know I like you. You'll never have to say I don't know if the pastor likes me or not. I'll, I'll make you a Christmas card. We'll even send out Christmas cards. But I'll send you a Christmas card. Right? I got there to order a picture of all us together. We would do that. I'd, uh, <laughs> I would uh, uh, cut your grass in the summertime if you needed me to. Uh, I, would, I would get the lawnmower and take it over there. I would uh, visit you in the hospital. I'd visit your sixth cousin in the hospital if you wanted to. Right? Bottom line is this. You give somebody a big gift, it changes your relationship. Do you agree with that? There's no way that a person really receives the gift of salvation and knows, you know, God's been gracious to me. Hey, you think that guy, that little story I read, would feel a little different about that pastor? What do you think you thought about that pastor after that? You know what he's saying? That guy's a good guy. That guy right there, hey, if he needs something, I'll do what I can for him. Right. See, this is, this is the way Christianity works. Paul said, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. See, when you realize, and see, this is what it comes down to, when you realize, I'm not righteous. I'm not righteous. <coughs> I've sinned. I've really sinned. I have sinned as done things that were totally wrong. I am not deserving of eternal life. But I have been justified <coughs> freely by His grace that came through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Spirit of God invades your heart and you begin to, the Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. In response you love the Lord. It changes your relationship to the Lord. Previously you might have said, yeah I believe in God. I know there is a God. But it changes your relationship beyond, yeah I believe He's real, to I love Him. So when somebody says that salvation can't be by grace or a gift, it has to be based on my behavior, they're wrong. It's a free gift. It's by grace through faith. But it does change a person's life. It does make a drastic difference in a person's life. And see, you can conclude Romans, and this, this is really um, interesting how the book of Romans concludes. And at the first, you can say the first eight chapters are devoted solely to explaining how you're saved. That's what it is, and I'm trying to go through it, went through it too quick, really. But the last three chapters, chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15, the last four chapters are devoted to how you should live your life, how you should live, 
Um, a lot of instruction, I'll give you an example. Romans 12, 1 is a classic verse. This is a verse that really is a, uh, just a verse that explains what it means to live as a Christian. Romans 12, 1, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See what he says right there. This is very important. Understand this. He says, you need to offer your body a living sacrifice to God, which means you say, Lord, here I am. I want you to use me. I give my life to you. He says, a living sacrifice, holy. You need to be holy. You need to have clean hands, clean heart. You need to live a sin, uh, get as much sin out of your life as you possibly can. You need to live according to God's commandments. You need to live a holy life. He says, don't be conformed to the world. You don't live like everybody else in the world lives. You be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And say, so here's the thing about that. Am I going to go to heaven because I do that? No, you've already read in the book. We've already talked about this. You are made righteous by grace through, the, through faith through the, because of the, the death of Christ on the cross. But the reality is we're still supposed to live a godly life, not to get ourselves to heaven, but because we love the Lord, because of what he did for us. So the Bible is full of commandments. See, I'll give you, this, to me, this is another important point right here. I'm going to start taking, see, and this is what I'm trying to say. Salvation comes first, then a new life. The new life is connected to the fact that I'm saved. But I'm not saved because I live a new life. It's, it's just like $100,000. If you gave me that money, you just give me that money. My reaction to that money did not earn me that money. It's because of what you did for me. But to me, these verses right here, Romans 13, verse 11, see, he's going to kind of get on to them about they're not living right. And to me, it's kind of important what he says right here. Romans 13, 11. He says, and do this, knowing that the time, knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness. Not in lewdness and lust. Not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. To fulfill its lust. See, he's really trying to encourage them to live a godly life. He says, look, knowing the time, it's time for us to wake up. Wake up. It's like you're asleep. He says, wake up. Our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. See, he's saying, look, the clock's ticking. We're getting close to the finish line. The end of the world's going to come. Your own death is going to come. You need to wake up. And he says, look, it's high time to wake up out of your slumber. Our salvation is near to the first place. And he says, let us cast off the deeds of darkness. Any type of sin that's in your life, you need to remove it. You need to throw it off. You need to get away from it. You need to remove it from your life. And, and so he's encouraging them wholeheartedly to live a godly life. Why? Because the end is near. Because our salvation is near now the first believe. So th this is what people can't understand sometimes. You are instructed in the Bible over and over and over to live a godly life. I mean, there's no doubt about it. There is no, okay, that's fine. Do whatever you want to do since you're saved. You go live in sin. Do whatever you want to do. The Bible never would say anything like that. But the Bible does say you're saved by grace, it's a gift, you're saved by faith, it's free, and then you need to live a godly life. Why would you live a godly life? To honor the Lord, to make a difference in the lives of people around you, to make a difference in your own life, because it produces the best life on earth. But the instruction is not based on you need to do this, or, or say, it was clear in that passage they were really not living like they should have, but he didn't tell them you need to get saved again. He's just telling them you need to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. So sometimes even Baptists have a bad reputation. Baptists people think Baptists teach you get saved, you can do whatever you want to do. I will never agree with that. Not for one second. The Bible's going to teach you salvation is a gift. You trust in Christ. And see, this is the this is the one thing. What you said I'll close by reading these two verses. To me, these are two great verses out of Romans, and it helps explain why this is important. What the end result is. In other words, why do you need to understand this this morning? Why? I'm just going to read you one more verse, okay? Why is it important to understand how you're saved? Well, number one, so you can be saved. Number two, it'll make a real difference in your life. And it's Romans 15, 13. 
this one of how verse comes to end of Romans. And Romans it gives you the Romans road on how to be saved, how, how to know that you have eternal life. Um, and it's based on grace. It's based on trusting in Christ. It's based on that apart from the law. It's good news. The Bible's full of good news for anybody. And we need to understand that. But Romans 15, 13, listen to this verse. This is the end of it. After you read all this, this is what you should do. It says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, this is, what, this is what can happen in your life when you understand this. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing. And may you abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the more you understand about grace, the more you understand about salvation, the more likely you are to have joy and peace in your life the more likely you are to abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Because look, I'm not, it goes back to this question. And this, is really, this is really a question that used to be asked all the time. And people, uh, it's, it's, it's an effective question because very rarely can someone answer this question honestly and accurately. Are you 100% sure that if you die, you go to heaven? Are you 100% sure about that? Well, are, are you sure about that? Well, I can say this morning, and I, I mean, I, I am not boasting. I am not right. I am 100% sure about that. I have joy. I have peace. I abound in hope. I, I, I'm not worried about some things in life. One thing I have not worried about in years is what's going to happen when I die. What's going to happen when I die? Well, I'm not worried about that anymore because I know how I'm saved, and I know the reality of I'm saved by grace through faith, not apart from the deeds of the law, that I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because I've been justified by faith. The way to sin death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's why it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, and may you abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. To have joy and peace and hope in life is invaluable. And everybody wants to have that. Everybody uh, pursues that. But the, the foundation of that is knowing that my sins have been forgiven and that I have eternal life. And I'm going to conclude by reading a, a, a couple of things out of this book again that I really found helpful. Um, I like the way he describes this. And you have to go back. This, this is the significant thing to understand that I am not saved based on my performance. If I'm saved based on my performance, then um, a lot of times I'm going to be in trouble. But I'm just going to read a couple of things out of this book right here. And this is what it says. How can you rest if you aren't assured final? If you aren't assured passage on the final flight home, many people don't. Many Christians don't. They live with a deep-seated anxiety about eternity. They think they are saved, hope they are saved, but still they doubt, wondering, "Am I really saved?" This is not merely an academic question. Children who accept Christ ask it. Parents of prodigals ask it. So do friends of the wayward. It services in the heart of the struggler. It seeps in the thoughts of the dying. When we forget our vow to God, does God forget us? Does God place us on a standby list? Our behavior gives us reason to wonder. We are strong one day, weak the next. Devoted one hour, slacking the next. Believing, then unbelieving. Our lives mirror the contours of a roller coaster. Highs and lows. Conventional wisdom draws a line through the middle of these fluctuations. Perform above this line and enjoy God's acceptance. But dip below it and expect a pink slip from heaven. In this system, a person is lost and saved multiple times a day, in and out of the kingdom on a regular basis. Salvation becomes a matter of timing. You just hope you die on an upswing. No security, stability, or confidence. This is not God's plan. He draws the line, but he draws it beneath our ups and downs. Jesus' language could be stronger. And I'm giving them eternal life, and they shall never lose it, or perish throughout the ages. To all eternity, they shall never without any means be destroyed, and no one is able to snatch them out of my hand. Jesus promised a new life that could not be forfeited or terminated. Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Ebbs and flows continue, but they never disqualify. Ups and downs may mark our days, but they will never banish from his kingdom. On and off, salvation never appears in the Bible. Salvation is not a repeated phenomenon. Scripture contains no example of a person who was saved, then lost, then re-saved, then lost again. What's, he, what's the point he's getting at there? If my salvation is based on my behavior, which is either one of two ways, either it's based on a little bit of my behavior or it's not based on my behavior at all. One of two things. I mean, 
It can't be both. The Bible says in Romans 11, 6, if it's by grace, then it's no longer by works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Either it's a gift and it's free and it's grace or it's not. It's one or the other. And if it's not, then um, I'm always in jeopardy. It's always based on am I living right today? Because like Max Lucado said, our life is like a roller coaster. There's ups and downs. There's good days, there's bad days. I'm living like I ought to be. Now I'm not living like I ought to be. I did good for a little while. Now I'm not doing good for a little while. What am I, where am I at with the Lord? Well, that's, that's not the way that salvation is. And the more you understand that, that's how he says, Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace and believing. May you abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The reality is, the only way I have joy and peace and confidence, the only way I will live my life with deep concern about what's going to happen to me when I die, or what's going to happen to somebody else when they die, is I understand, you know what? I'm not perfect. The Bible says if anyone claims to be without sin, he deceives himself. There's nobody in this room who's without sin. So you're deceiving yourself if you think you're living up to some standard that we created in our own minds. There's no standard that we're going to measure up to. So the fact is, it's very important to understand you're saved by grace or saved as a gift of God. I'll read one more paragraph. He says, where there is no assurance of salvation, there is no peace. No peace means no joy. No joy results in fear-based lives. Is this the life God creates? No. Grace creates a confident soul who declares, I know whom I have believed, or I'm convinced that in God I have to trust in Him for that day. See, grace, when you understand this, you know as well as you know 5 plus 5, and as well as you know your ABCs. I know how I'm saved. The reality is, the reason I know it is not because I got a hold of a different book and I read something somewhere that you've not read. It's all in this book. It's all in Romans. It explains to you how you as a sinner can have eternal life. Now you can have confidence that you have eternal life. Now you can have joy, hope, and peace, and you can abound in those things by believing the good news of the gospel. And it doesn't matter, you know. I don't know. It's very interesting. I, and, and it's very interesting when you ever ask somebody, do you believe you're going to go to heaven when you die? It's, it's a scary thing. To, I, I, I hesitate to ask that question much because I don't think people will spot it. But I almost know they ain't going to have a good answer most of the time. And you got to kind of try to, well, you know, not really. Uh, that's a lot of people think, but there's a way that seems right to man but in his destruction. The only answer that's going to suffice is to say this. I'm a sinner. Jesus is my Savior. I believe in him. That's the bottom line. If anybody in this room, that's all, that, Jesus said, I'm the way. He's the way. There's no other way. There's no way of being good. There's no way of going to church. There's no way of, that's, that's not how you're going to be made right with God. It is through faith in Christ. And um, I hope that you're sitting here this morning already knowing this, already clear on this. I can tell some of you are. But I know some of you do not understand this. And what Paul said in Galatians 2.16, he said, Knowing that a man is justified by faith in Christ, even we have put our faith in Christ. See, he said, I know that's the way. And so I, I put my faith in Christ for my salvation. That's what you've got to do this morning. You've got to trust in Christ. Romans 10, 13 says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You call out to the Lord, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I trust in you. That's how you're saved. That's how the transaction takes place and you become right with God. And then you can leave and you can have this in your life. Joy, peace, and hope. In spite of your struggles, in spite of your past, in spite of whatever happens in life, you can have joy, hope, and peace in believing the good news of the gospel. I promise you this. That I, 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 I know this. This book has good news. At the end of the day, the Bible has good news. It's a book of good news. That's what gospel means. When Jesus is born, I said, we'll bring you good news. It'll cause great joy for all the people. And that's how the Savior's been born. It's good news. And you, you got to understand it's good news. Understand it as grace. Understand it as a free gift. Understand it as hope for me. Understand it that way. Then you love it. Then you're thankful. Bible is the kingdom of God. It's like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found. And this is the best thing I've ever found. This is the best news I've ever found. And don't you know you believe it yourself? You receive it. You believe it. You try to share it with somebody else. It's good news. It gives hope to people. And so, um, hopefully that helps you this morning. All right. Um, what we'll do is have a time of invitation. It's time for you to respond to the Lord. I don't, I don't know what, where your life is, how, uh, what's going on in your life. I know that uh, it's very possible you have things you need to pray about, people you need to pray for. The altar is open for you to come and do that. You can pray for yourself. You can pray for our church. But I want to encourage you to respond to the Lord. If you just want to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you for grace. Thank you for your amazing grace. That's something we should all feel in our heart. 
We're all the recipients of grace if we're Christians. Paul says, by grace you've been saved. Okay? So hopefully you feel that in your heart this morning. And if you've never experienced that, you turn to the Lord for grace. You don't have to try to be good enough. You don't have to try to work your way to heaven. You just turn to Jesus and trust in Him and ask Him to save you and forgive you if you will. Uh, Ms. Emily, do you mind to come play for us on the piano? Uh, I appreciate Ms. Emily helping out for us this morning. You can just